yeah, welcome everybody to uh, to our uh, webinar this uh, this time around around big rooms. Uh, just wanted a little bit of a briefing on on the ADP Plus Lean Joint Working Group. I think a lot of you are already familiar with this. Uh, we have a lot of a lot of participants from uh, owned organizations, uh, institutions, you know, EPCs and and, uh, and specialty uh, groups and, and consultants. Um, Myself and, and John Strickland with Collaborative Flow are the uh, are the chairs, and you can always reach out to us. Uh, we're always uh, welcoming new members, uh, get different ideas. So uh, why don't you go ahead and click to the next one, uh, get to the meet. Uh, just a, a, some briefings. We we formed in 2021 as part of the CI uh, ADP Community of Business Advancement. Uh, our vision is to bring all the all the best practices uh, together: ADP, Lean, Operation Science, and others that are out there. Uh, we believe uh, Big Room is is uh, absolutely uh, great across all of them, so that's why we're we're sharing this today. And uh, we do want to have this open forum, right? So where everybody can can exchange ideas, um, you know, meet new people, network, and and as well as as well as actually contribute uh, to what we like to call our next gen project delivery, uh, really uh, all around advanced uh, project delivery pr uh, practices and programs. So um, anyway, with that, I think um, uh, we're getting ready to get into the, into the webinar. Uh, this one today is about big rooms. Uh, you know, it's a critical collaboration. Uh, and next, uh, next month, uh, October 2nd, we're going to have one on site material management on a focus on AP Lean and operation science. Uh, October 30th, uh, around contracting strategy and requirements. And then uh, another one uh, in, towards the end of November uh, around look ahead planning and production control. So they're, uh, they're, they're subject to adjustments on the dates, but those pretty much have been sticking. So at any rate, uh, we're welcoming um, everybody to join those webinars. Uh, today- Look at um, those friend, handsome faces, Fernando. Yeah, oh I, I know, my gosh. Uh, I, I think you touched up mine a little bit. Um, so <laughs> at any rate, uh, you know, Dan and I are, from, are, not, um, are not strangers to this. And uh, you know myself, I have, a, I have a deep background in in ADP and lean concepts and production management and control, uh, and uh, a member of the CII group and chair of the ADP plus lean joint working group and the uh, and I'm also a chair of the uh, RT 405 uh, one culture and how do we drive you know leverage culture to drive uh, adoption of of uh, fast quick adoption of AWP. And I'm going to encourage you. You know, it's it's something really important. I'll I'll, I'll probably speak to, uh, more about it later towards the end. Uh, but if you want to get involved with uh, an, a, a critical topic around culture, please uh, reach out to me. Dan, why don't you say a few words about yourself? I would be more than happy to, Fernando. My name is Dan Fouché. It's spelled just like it sounds. Ha ha. Um, been in this business coming up on 50 years. I've I uh, I usually say 45, but I'll be honest. This is these are all friends, right? <laughs> Um, and uh, design, development, uh, uh, and, and construction principally, uh, and have a lot of experience with big rooms and, uh, and teaching it and coaching it and facilitating it. And the big room very often needs a facilitator to work properly. Uh, and so we'll be bringing that to the group. Uh, in addition, uh, it is 9-11, and we should be mindful of the fact that 22 years ago on this date, uh, a, a major thing happened that, uh, that changed at least the world in the U.S. and pretty much the rest of the world, too, in some in some way. Uh, we were just talking about it in the green room. And, and uh, so uh, we appreciate you all being here today and we honor them. Uh, desired outcomes from this webinar. Fernando, what's what's the what's the first one? You know, hey, first of all, you know, big rooms or collaboration centers are much more than a conference meeting room. And we see that quite a bit. Uh, you know, we are intending to create an environment where visual communication and collaboration across interconnected stakeholders, people that that need to get an, something accomplished, a project for the most set. And it becomes a mindset right across these team members to drive countless project benefits. So this is these are things we want to get uh, have you uh, uh, get out of this presentation. You can go to the next one. Uh, OK, leverage mainly. This is came out of the healthcare industry and Dan and I were at the, at the beginning of this really. I uh, moved into the general building industry and big room concepts and facilitated processes that we're going to show you can easily be applied to the industrial space. And we want you to really get that. Um, whether what, Whatever industry you're in, this, this can be leveraged no matter what you do. Um, you know, designing big rooms, it's, you know, and again, not just conference rooms, should be considered early from feed through handover to operations, right? So there is an intentional design that has to go into this. 
uh, I think the last one. Um, it does, uh, Big Rooms enable this whole idea of visual interactive planning. And it's not just used in, in typical just, just planning, right? Uh, or path of construction, right? It really can be used throughout um, ideation. People can come together, team building exercises, decision making, uh, critical decision making, production planning, you know, which which is really where most people go, but not to the level that you can do production planning, and work process optimization. So it's beyond just path of construction, and it's just beyond, hey, this is the last planner session or what have you, but uh, you can use it um, quite effectively in so many situations uh, to drive that level of collaboration and inter interactive uh, engagement across stakeholders. Amanda, so I, I, I grew up on a farm and we had barns and barns are very big rooms, but they are not a big room. Uh, <laughs> and that's the whole point is- But they what can be turned big, into big rooms. <laughs> if it's not just a big room, well, yes, I, I'm big. gonna tell you. <laughs> yes, let's give Go us ahead. a little insight here, Dan. Uh, why not? Uh, for the first thing it's not is co-location. It's very often coupled with co-location. But just because you're co-locating doesn't mean you are creating a big room. Uh, a co-location is multiple companies working under a single roof. Uh, maybe there's the architect over there and the owner sitting over there and the builders there and, and uh, their inspectors sitting there. And, and, and it's usually for co-location, a big room. Or as, as Fernando and I ran into uh, with the Stanford uh, Health Project, uh, a, a series of trailers that create a huge big room, but in the middle of that was a big room. Uh, and so just because it is a large room doesn't make it a big room. Uh, because as you said earlier, Fernando, big room is a mindset and we must be mindful of that. It's an intense focus for advancing the work. It's collaborative behaviors that establish high performing teams. It can even exist without a dedicated space. Uh, there can be virtual big rooms, but a big room is a commitment to the project, the team, and to working together. And that big room right there, uh, Fernando and I are both very familiar with because that was the one at Stanford, uh, the new Stanford Hospital. Uh, and it, 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 you can see it was a large room also, but it had a big room concept to it. Uh, yeah. Because what we want to do in a big room is break down silos. And I, I do want to emphasize exactly what Dan said earlier, is that just outside of this room is an entire co-located group of stakeholders, right? So they're all within, will all within reach and can immediately leverage this yeah. big room environment. To the, to the left, uh, outside that door, were a group of designers all mixed together. To the right, were a group of contractors mixed in with, with trade contractors. And behind the camera here, or actually behind that wall, uh, is uh, w were a number of the owners' uh, leadership that were there, so it was uh, it allowed for alignment to the goals of the project because it keeps bringing us back there. Now, many co-located offices and trailers have a large meeting room. That's usually where big rooms are chosen, but that's why we confuse co-locations and big rooms. Uh, a big room is. It, it too often has these giant tables that are impossible to move. Uh, and so it, a little later on, we'll talk about how to set up a big room. One of the things you don't want is a giant immovable board room table in your big room. Uh, but you can also have virtual big rooms uh, and you can have roving big rooms. That is to say, uh, a virtual big room obviously would be online uh, and with teams that are spread around the world or across the country. Uh, that can be a necessity. Uh, you need then a, a big room space online in something like Miro or Mural or some other uh, uh, host like that. Uh, a roving big room means maybe you meet at the, at the Starbucks this week and another uh, you know, at a restaurant another week at somebody's office the week after that and, and you, you can move it around. It's the mindset that we're going for here. So big rooms work best if they're on site if they're near the work uh, and you can use virtual tools if you must, but don't rely on them if you can avoid it. Uh, and the more team interaction, the better the sharing of information. So a lot of uses. Fernando, you uh, you and I both contributed to, to uh, making this list. Go, go with the first group there. Yeah, so uh, you mean the, the image there? Yeah, well, the, or, with yeah, the planning and the... Yeah, so, so you know, there, 
uh, again, you know, planning is is typically the most immediate um, idea of how to leverage a big room, right? People can come in, they can do lean planning, which is, you know, might be looking at milestone schedules, might be looking at weekly work plans or or look ahead planning, you know, and and ADVP can can also take advantage of that because there's all these opportunities for planning. Yeah. And again, there, there, we talk about path of construction, which is a perfect example for the use of a big room. And there are many in our in our industry that use it quite effectively. And you probably all have heard John Fish talk about that. Uh, you, you know, he's probably one of the the, the leading leading uh, um, individuals in this industry that that delivers um, a big room experience in the industrial space. Yeah. So um, yeah, so absolutely, uh, planning is the one of the first things that we think about. Nice. Uh, learning obviously takes place in there. You can it can be both formal learning, you know, the, the training of a group. It could be uh, study action groups or video action teams that are reading or or viewing the similar material and getting together and talking about it. Uh, it's used for team building. It, it, in fact, that's a that's one of the outputs is good team building. Uh, it's essential for collaborative problem solving. Uh, target cost conversations. Uh, that relates to the, the uh, practice of target value delivery, uh, where cost is a criteria for design, and you're driving always to a target cost. Decision making, very valuable in a big room. Commitments to each other, uh, and we very often post those. Uh, team health and assessments, uh, sometimes by survey, and then sometimes just by talking with each other and doing a retrospective. Uh, ad hoc conversations, collision spaces, we sometimes use that phrase, uh, breakout sessions. The, that's the, the fact that it may be a very large assembly of people in a big room or even breakout groups of smaller groups dictates why it's so important uh, it, to have a functionally uh, flexible big room. Yeah, one thing I'll point out to you, Dan, on, on that yeah. uh, image, and you'll see this constantly as we move through this webinar, is if you look at the walls, the walls yep. are loaded with information and not just information uh, to share, which is critical, but inter information to interact with, right? Yep. Purposeful that people can are, are meant to mark things up on a regular basis or add or have conversations around, right? So whether you're a formal meeting or whether you are bringing in a, a team just to talk about it, something very specific, you know, um, and so you'll you'll notice that these big rooms are not just a place to gather people. Yeah, and those are this aren't just federal bulletins that are posted up there. This is actual work. We're actually working yeah. on this. Yeah, and it's critical because uh, it's not as common in in the industrial space. But I, I do want to point out a, a, a very few things. You know, path of construction development, you know, including all the iterations and refinements that are needed. A big room will contribute heavily to that. You know, and there are similar applications for, you know, developing a path of engineering aligned to that procurement, fabrication, commissioning and startup and others can also real, you know, uh, play out their their uh, uh, strategies and, and processes uh, within a big room. Production pool planning, which is something, you know, we don't do very well. There's there's there are companies in the industrial space that that do uh, production pool planning, which is looking at how do we make things ready, and when when they when they become ready, we pull uh, those activities into the plan, right? But we can look at that for engineering deliverables in a big room, construction activities, commissioning and startup activities, right? Uh, and I think which is very critical, which is not used enough, is work process optimization, yeah. right? How do we uh, how do we bring this you know these ideations uh, uh, capabilities that we all have? In coming up with better solutions on how we want to conduct and ex execute work. Um, this is an example of, of a, a big room environment, right? And you can see it's loaded on the wall with planning information, electronic and, and sticky notes, work structures, right? So people can go back and forth, work across teams. In fact, on that upper uh, right uh, image, there are seven teams represented in the planning process, each having their own, their own stream, uh, work stream. And you can see by the sticky notes that they're interacting with information. They meet there every morning and or and once a week to do different things, right? It's all around uh, around deliverables and focused on how do they get execute work and what's available or not available. And when you have this kind of interaction, you can go to the next slide. And this also is something that Dan and I worked on, is that we can take that same information and put it where people need it, and they can do their own planning in in their own quasi big room environment in the field. 
right, where where people can interact with the same information that's been interacted with the with others or they've already previously agreed on. So again, frontline supervisors really, you know, uh, coming together, sharing with their crews, what their teams, the exercises, what's what the priorities are, and they make and they can make those decisions, you know, based on a, on a, uh, the, the collective reasoning between all the stakeholders. So they're in a in a co-located big room venue. Uh, it's continuously located space, a common work area. It allows for continuous collaboration, move, groups moving in and out. Uh, if it's if it's very popular, as it was at Stanford, you you have to book it. Uh, there's some you know you have to sign up because there may be somebody already reserved for that uh, particular uh, group to meet. Uh, it can serve as an immediate ad hoc meeting space if the space is available and when you need to say, hey, let's let's take this conversation in the big room. We need to work on the on, we need a wall we can work on, uh, and and. That's an that's an idea that you what you what you don't want is a big room that's full of windows. It's fun to look out. It's really hard to put stuff up on on windows and at least have them stay there for very long. Uh, it does serve the purpose of the needs of those who are currently in it, but it can change to serve the needs of those who come in next. Uh, a recurring big room venue it could be where people meet on a regular basis, but they may not have a co-located space. Uh, so they can use rented spaces or spaces that could be checked out. Uh, they, it has to meet the needs of attendees in terms of location, the ease of the commute, and so on, uh, and the needs of the agenda. Uh, is there sufficient technology? Is the room set up properly? And so on. These are all considerations. And then there's the infamous hybrid big room venue. This is tough, by the way, uh, tough to facilitate. Uh, we're talking about a combination of in-person and virtual meeting spaces. Uh, I've, I've done some of that at Facebook. And uh, quite honestly, uh, one or the other gets ignored. And typically, it's the, it's the virtual. Uh, and and the, the people who are in the room are in each other's space, literally. Uh, and, and so they tend to stay engaged. The people who are not, who are on virtual, uh, can can maybe get forgotten uh, or they don't speak up or they don't feel like they're part of the group. So uh, if you can meet face to face, that's most desirable. Uh, but if you if you need the hybrid room, a uh, big room venue, then it does allow for regular collaboration wherever the team member is. Now, yeah. one of the go ahead. Yeah, I was going to add on the technology uh, part of it. You know, uh, technology is changing and over the past several years there there have been um, collaboration electronic collaboration boards right and you can have people working and interacting with the same information um, uh, you know using these massive screens and these touch screens uh, and I think um, I, it's not common probably now but it probably will be as our projects you know move toward the future and not everybody can be co-located but when they feel like they're co-located using these yeah. technologies uh, I think that will make a huge difference and I think I think we should be looking for that you know, to be to be a a common practice here in the next three to five years, that we'll all have these <clears throat> command centers, right, uh, where where people are really interacting very very effectively across uh, across uh, uh, offices, which with a virtual co-location experience, I think. And, and Fernando, that that is a really a valuable point because it is getting better. And in a big room setting, if it's hybrid, uh, if we're all looking at the same information on a screen that's a shared screen and we all have our information in it uh that then is the face-to-face -face in you know, quote unquote uh mm -hmm. that, that we're really looking for we're interacting because we're interacting with the same screen if you will or the same information on there yeah right. uh, and, and that facilitates the understanding that a, a big room wheels its collective brain power to advance rapidly advance work in in shorter time frames uh, we we don't need to have 60 minute meetings all the time. Uh, we very often need a 10 minute meeting or a 32 minute meeting or you know or, or two hour meeting in some cases to increase the value that their work produces and help drive down project costs. So why should this big room thing be in your toolkit, Fernando? Why are big rooms? Yeah. Great well, idea. here's what I here, here's what I 
I've learned in my experience that Dan has too, there is no project manager that could possibly understand everything about their project. No one underneath them that could possibly understand it. You know, um, you don't have to know, you, you don't know what you don't know, but someone on your team does, right? Or someone outside your team knows who to, knows who to get involved to make better decisions. Um, the, the interesting thing, I think, and how we understand this is the power is in distributed control. Right. A lot of us think, well, gee, I'm I'm hired in this position and it, I am I am in control of this project. And if I don't make the decision, nothing's going to happen the right way. You know, but if we look at distributing control, taking it down to who is the right person to to, to handle this or be involved or make decisions. Right. We can enable all the brains to contribute, not just to be a silent partner waiting for the big boss to, to, to choose which way we go. Um, it is a holistic approach uh, or allows for a holistic approach. And collective decisions better manage risk. And yeah. these big rooms enable collective decisions to be made. Um, they absolutely, when you bring all those brains in, produce better outcomes, decision, and productive teams. I don't know how many times I've been in a room where someone comes in saying, we're going this route. At the end of the day, they're doing just the opposite because yeah. they are now, they, they have, have, they're, they're better informed. And now they understand the needs of others and how they interact or they need to interact with the information or the project or whatever it is and say, this is why we need to go a different, a different route. Yeah, that, that's, that's well said. So how do you set up a big room? What are logistics involved? You actually can benefit from knowing this if you're gonna set up a big room. Uh, I had the experience uh, at LAX uh, on, a, on a, a very large team that was there building a terminal, uh, the midfield terminal. They they set up a big room. They had the idea we want to do a big room, and so they delegated it to one person who bought all the stuff. Uh, but he bought all the stuff on a budget, so the chairs didn't have wheels, the tables didn't have wheels, and everyone in the big room was constantly squeaking, and it was hard to reconfigure, and it was noisy. <laughs> and so this is kind of what you want to pay attention to. If you're co-located, if you're recurring, or if you're hybrid, uh, decide on the big room strategy as early as possible. Uh, and, and then three to four hours, set aside the time for a collaborative group to meet before any hard decisions are locked in. And gather the leadership, especially those who can approve, approve the resources, the core team, that is the, 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 uh, you know, the, the PMs, if you will, the project managers from a, a variety, from all the different organizations, representatives from from different companies uh and representatives from different role types do a diagonal cut across the silos so that you get all all the silos included but you get people from all different uh roles and walks of life and make sure the needs of the team are factored into the big room decisions so for example um Resist the urge to throw a big room conference, a big conference table in there and with nice rolling chairs. Everyone feels very important. Got a ceiling mounted projector and and they call it a day after about 30 minutes of figuring this out. Well, no, not so much. Yeah, um, actually, actually, what you can say is, yes, have a conference room. Yeah, yes. <laughs> but uh, it's not the big room. You know, That's not the big room. Yeah. yeah. You, you, you can not flash yeah. all you want somewhere else. <laughs> That's right. That's right. So you, you want to be able to have a space that is adequate for, la for the last planner system or any kind of planning that you may be doing. Uh, as you can see, the, 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 most of the tables are out of the way in this one. And uh, the entire wall space on one side and a little part of the other is used for uh, for plotter paper. Um, here's, uh, you know, you, you may need to configure small breakout areas. So it needs to have that flexibility. Uh, if you're gonna do training and onboarding, look at that chubby guy on the left, yeah, Fernando. Exactly. That, was, that was me those 45 are, those are classic times suspenders. Yes, very stylish. Um, yes. <laughs> the, here was here some training and onboarding going on, and you can see people are broken up into tables that are working with each other and all that sort of thing. Uh, noise has to be a factor. Lighting has to be a factor. Uh, and, and accessible power and data. This was a big room at Google. Uh, and uh, they had power drops and uh, so that they could configure things, move things around 
uh, the, you know, the, the, the tables were movable, uh, the drops made it more configurable, uh, and then they had that giant wall where everybody could do their planning uh, and other kinds of things. So all of that is, is useful. Uh, is there a standard look? Yeah, maybe, not really, um, because uh, you, you may end up using it for parties. Like when somebody graduates, a team graduates because they've, they've, uh, they've taken a bunch of uh, training courses in the big room and uh, they want to all celebrate. Uh, you may need the ability to have a nice quiet space. So there may be either in the big room or slightly adjacent to the big room, some breakout rooms. Uh, it's all part of it. Uh, visuals, you said it, Fernando, super, super essential uh, to be able to have the current visuals for how things are happening. Uh, target, uh, upper right corner, target value delivery tracker. There, there, that's the money. That's the money thermometer there. In the middle uh, are, are, are some, uh, some plans that stretch out for multiple weeks. Uh, on the lower left is a, is a site plan. Got to be kept current because if it's out of date, nobody's going to going to pay attention to it. Uh, all the all the various metrics that the team may have uh, for for measuring how well it's doing, uh, all got to be part of that visuals. How easily will they be read? Will you use digital versus printed? Uh, how often will the visuals be updated? Uh, are you displaying out of date information because that'll confuse people and send the wrong message to the team? Uh, the wall space, yeah. how much of your wall space should be covered? Well, you know, you can have bulletin boards and, and whiteboards, but boards can take away valuable wall space. Uh, and so it's actually better, in my personal opinion, to have a blank wall and put stuff up there or one of those walls that, that is painted in such a way that you can you can write and dry erase on it, but you can also stick things up to it so that uh, it's a multiple-use wall. Uh, don't lose the use of a board by not taking the old visuals down. Uh, and maybe consider rolling boards. Uh, there, here's an example of one in the lower right corner. Uh, that's a rolling board, you know, and, and uh, I was in a big room. For now, this is, this is the one at, uh, in Sacramento back in 2008-9. We used the big rolling boards. In fact, they were bigger than that uh, as, as, as ways of walling off a small group meeting from the rest of the noise that was going on in the co-located space. So it, it allowed people to create ad hoc, if you will, uh, small spaces, uh, but they, they can they can be useful for breakout groups and and that sort of thing. Yeah, the technology you mentioned. Go ahead. Yeah, yeah one, one thing I wanted to add, and it goes to the last two slides you just did, is the information that you're actually posting. It's yeah. gotta be, it's gotta be current and it's gotta be refreshed all the time. And what you see often is a big whiteboard that says yeah. save and it never gets erased for two weeks, you know, because someone thinks it's important and there's, that means there's no action being done. And, and, uh, and so anyway, um, you know, uh, change on plans, changing them almost daily, yeah. you know, is, is, uh, is adds a lot of value because people can work with the information that now that not only did they, uh, uh, post yesterday, but now they can interact with new information. And maybe it's weekly, right? But the 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 idea is that you got to leverage the space, you know, to exchange information, not to stagnate or display it, you know. Amen. Only. Yeah. So should your technology be a projector, uh, and should it be mounted versus put away? Uh, mm -hmm. Where should it be? Uh, are there connections for more modern computers? Mm -hmm. uh, does it have the cable supply? Uh, in the room, a uh, handy. Uh, do you need a screen, or can you project on the wall? Uh, how about local dimming for presentations? Uh, conference calling. Can you is it is the room set up for that? For screen sharing uh, with fast internet. Uh, how about the notification of room reservation? Uh, and and then the furniture, fixtures, and equipment. I I pointed out the best tables and chairs for the room uh, don't make it a rigid meeting room. Can the furniture be easily moved? Uh, can it? Can you create a highly configurable space, or is it too heavy and too loud to scrape against the floor as you're moving things around? Uh, don't match the meetings to the furniture. Match the furniture to the meetings. Uh, you know, and and yes, new project. Yeah. Yes, it's time to buy furniture uh, yeah. or rent furniture. Hey, also uh, when you do that, um, you know, I I think. Um, 
you know, the, the fact that you're going to be projecting a lot of information and not just looking at screens. And so how many projectors are, are you going to display? What are you going to put on one? You could be flying a, a 3D model on one and showing yeah. information, spreadsheet information on another or some other production control kind of information on a third. Right. So so the imagination of how these can be used is limitless. And um, and that's why the uh, what Dan's talking about, the the flexibility uh, of designing these rooms to enable people to, to use them with with, uh, you know, a myriad of different uh, of different purposes, uh, yeah. I think is kind of is very is very critical and should be given, uh, you know, the proper thought it, it deserves. I, I think it takes that three or four hour meeting of all the right people diagonally through the, the cut through the silos and rolls and all that. I think it takes yeah. that in order to really think through it, Fernando. Uh, right. I remember one one conversation we were we were going to take over a, a, a space that Citibank had vacated uh, and they already had uh, wall partitions and, you know, cubicles uh, with tall walls so that because they were very private. Uh, and and the designers and contractors came in and said, tear all of it out. We don't want that crap. <laughs> we we want an open space. We want to be able to to reconfigure as we need to. Uh, and then what are you going to name it? Uh, please don't call it a war room. You know what happens yeah, in war rooms? Me every time I hear that, you know, that war is, is yeah. declared. <laughs> it's you're, us versus you're, them, right? Yeah, it, it, you're office, anticipating. You know? conflict uh, and and I love this phrase collision spaces uh, you know these are we try to set up opportunities to meet with each other but sometimes the best conversations and the best ideas are some of them come from accidental collisions with each other uh, where ideas and people were unplanned interactions unplanned discussions information travels fast make decisions that will bolster the collaborative nature of a big room yeah and sometimes you discover things that actually will shut the job down for a period of time yeah. and if you yeah. didn't discover that you would you would have started early and you would have shut down fast and you would have been spending a lot of time and a lot of claim so sometimes the 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 worst news that you could think of might be the best news so people yeah. can go back and 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 rapidly replan something that can get them through that that difficult decision that they that they have to make because it was discovered in a collision and uh, you know, I've been through a few of those one of, yeah more than one of the one of the cool things about collision spaces is that it tends to be one to one or one to three or whatever and people who are who are shy in meetings and might not have brought up that that uh, existential threat that you just mentioned are are more relaxed and feel free to say it to just one other person or a small group of other people kind of yeah. off off the off cuff you know on the fly exactly so here's uh, here's some ideas for your big room kickoff uh include the whole staff that is once you've already set it up and now you want to open the big room include the whole staff so everyone can meet the team see how you fit together in the big room, set the expectations, create communication protocols, and share your org charts. Uh, essential that we immediately begin to understand how to, re who needs to be there, who, need, who can make decisions, who needs to be uh, sharing with what across silos and so on, uh, and, and walk through the issue resolution protocols and constraint removal plans. In other words, set up the team it, it to to create that kind of collaboration and we're typically using leaving rank at the door uh because we're coming in to collaborate as as human beings uh develop standard meeting rules and you, know, you may want to have facilitators and and uh, participants uh and and maybe you take turns facilitating but facilitation is a skill that has to be learned we're not born facilitators most of us and and so if we're going to rotate facilitators we need to have some training for them and maybe some feedback to help everyone get better a standard meeting schedule for the big room but but keep it a place where things get done and then celebrate when you have a dedicated space that will help turn multiple companies into one high performing team fernando we're at the point when we can talk about 
what we talked about. <laughs> what are some golden yeah. nuggets? That, what's your takeaway from all this? Well, you know, I think one is uh, we want the, a, a big room is intentional and it's by design, right? So we just can't think of, a, again, as a conference room and we can just turn it into a big room. You know, if it's, if it's the right configuration, yeah, if you pull everything out and we, we put everything in, yes, that's, that's kind of one of the key things. Uh, I, and I always love the way you start this out is the mindset, right? Yeah. I think I think that is, um, in fact, probably one of our questions coming up. But um, mm. this this idea of a mindset, right, and and how you gain that mindset uh, through these types of environments, because not everybody's going to come in here all happy to to share knowledge and all that, right? So a lot of people come with, with arms crossed and don't bother me, and and uh, the facilitation that you talked about is is critical. Yeah. It's critical. So, you know, it's a couple. I mean, uh, what else do you think there, uh, Dan? We should be. Uh... Well, I, I mean, I, I, you've talked about visuals. I think the visuals on the wall are really important and they must not be static. They need to be ever new. They need to be current. But also there needs to be a big wall space for new stuff, for for experimenting, for for doing a, a process map because we're you know, our processes. Are, are broken and there are too many signatures required or whatever. Uh, and, and so we need to we need to noodle on that together right now and fix that. Uh, or we need to do a pool plan or we need to do this thing or that thing. And and the ability to be that flexible and that collaborative in a single area that everyone has been introduced to in the kickoff meeting uh, and it, it, the room itself has been thoughtfully set up by that diagonal group of of folks from all the different organizations and all the different roles. Uh, those are all the, like the, the key elements yeah. for my point. Yeah, I think, I think one other one that's really going to, to, to drive us into the future a little bit is how we leverage technologies, right? Yeah. Not only, the, not only the, 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 the technology we think about, we talked about, uh, you know, you saw those command centers with all those screens and we talked about the, you know, future touch walls that where we can look and interact with the same information. Uh, but a big room is a source of an enormous data, right? And if we're not capturing that data and yeah. bringing it into a, a some to a database so we can actually understand where our projects are, you know, from from not only uh, engineering solutions or procurement solutions, but also construction construction status, you know, yeah. and our ability to execute work. I, yeah. I, I think if we if if one takeaway is that these big rooms are a significant source of how people are thinking to execute the project and let's get it because if we get it the right way and we present it the right way, that information turns into better decisions and better yeah. solution sets. Smartest thing an owner can do on a project is make sure there's a collaborative big room. Uh, I mean, one yeah. of the smartest, maybe not the smartest. That's the smartest will be to, to pick you to come in and help them, Fernando. <laughs> but yeah, one of yeah. the smartest, would be to, to to encourage the team collaboration by saying, I want you to spend a dedicated have a dedicated place uh, and a dedicated mindset that this is how we're going to run this project. Yeah, yeah. In fact, uh, I just I see a comment uh, in the question uh, from Max uh, Eklund about connected big rooms, and absolutely, <laughs> they are so spot on that you know uh, we can create that, and that's what these that's what this electronics can do is yeah. uh, is connecting all these all these big rooms. Uh, and wherever they are, because especially on the on the industrial space where where project teams are just cannot be co-located the way that we'd like them to be. Right. right. But they can be connected. So thanks, Max, for bringing that up. Appreciate that. What so, else we got? Um, there, Fernando? Any other questions right. coming our way? Yeah, yeah, we have we have some questions here, so I'll go through them. Um, first of all, you know, and I apologize for this. Uh, one of the first questions is what does AWP stand for? And that's ah. advanced work packaging, and you know it's uh, uh, we've been throwing that that term around, uh, but it's it's one of the of the uh, uh, leading best practices. You know, this one was was basically uh, uh, declared a best practice by uh, CII back in 2015. So that's yeah. advanced work packaging and workplace planning. And if you're not aware of it, you should probably uh, become aware of it because uh, that's our old ADVP plus lean effort, and is bringing these uh, these three. Uh, major um, accepted best practices, which, uh, you know, is advanced work packaging, lean construction, yeah. lean thinking uh, combined, and operation science, which is around production management and control. 
So those are the three things that have been operating independently, and our group is is supporting the the idea that it's all coming together. And, uh, and other for those, yeah, uh, let me just jump on that for a minute. For for those in the lean community who are here in our group, um, and and not familiar as familiar as they could be with advanced work packaging, uh, one of the big things uh, that advanced work packaging brings to lean last planner, for example, <clears throat> is constraint prevention, uh, removing the constraints before the, the design or the stuff ever gets to the field is really thoughtfully pulling out all the, cons removing constraints, identifying and removing constraints and, and preventing that from happening uh, later uh, in the field, because that's where, they, where it gets expensive. Yeah. So another question, actually, um, interesting is it's, uh, you know, that BIM, the, the term BIM wasn't really included one of the use cases uh, on a big room and whether that was on purpose. And, no. uh, you know, I, I, Dan, I'll let you start with that one. I, I, it was not on purpose and I'm sorry to all your BIMers. Uh, the, the <laughs> BIM is, you know, it, it's kind of like BIM is like air now. Uh, you know, we don't talk about it much, but it's there. Uh, we use it all the time. Uh, and and the the BIM um, usage it, it is now not just it's not just for design anymore. It's it's actually making its way into uh, all the all the elements of uh, of construction. Uh, and and very often we'll find folks you know with iPads walking around with iPads uh, you know looking pull, pulling up the BIM and and looking and seeing what's supposed to be right there and or the digital twins thing going on uh, so it absolutely essential uh, one of the one of the ways that, I mean teams can design teams can and uh, and trade contractor teams can can do uh, con uh, you know, conflict uh, prevention uh, any way they want to but one of the ways is in a big room I, I've seen groups get together and uh, they'll they'll highlight a clash uh, and and kick it around how should we do that and and so you're you're getting the energy of ideas and discoveries that are immediately solved uh, right on the spot. And it sometimes it's easier to do that in a big room than, than just kind of back and forth. Yeah, and I'll, I'll emphasize the fact that, yeah, it's these days, you know, Bill, uh, BIM um, uh, and the, the, the concept behind it, the 3D effort of it and all the information that is associated with it are, it's almost like, hey, that's, we gotta start, we gotta have that. Right, yeah. and it, as as much as we can. Not every project has 3D. I'm, it's interesting that, that you know that they still exist. Uh, but the fact is, we we have to leverage that when we want to visualize what we're going to plan. And in, in the in the industrial space, in the ADP space, right, we call them virtual construction models. You yeah. know, and they are loaded with information and and uh, attributes, so we can look at packaging strategies. We can do all sorts of things. We can build status and and highlight things. You know, and uh, I've, I've been involved with the, the the technologies that support that level of, of visualization, status visualizations, you know, and um, and create partnerships and and, and uh, technologies that do that. So uh, the, the fact is that's really critical. Uh, the whole concept of of building information models and 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 virtual construction models to help us make better decisions is essential. So. Yeah. Dan, I'm going to blame you for not even mentioning it, but you it's know, my, hopefully, my fault. I think, I, yeah, I think all your uh, images clearly showed some of that, and we, uh, I saw one or two showing the models splashing around. That's for sure. Yep, yeah, they, they were there, but you're right. I should have said the word uh, because it's it uh, is absolutely an essential part. Yeah. Okay. What so we got, got more? Yeah. yeah. Okay. Another one. Um, one concern uh, is around having a big room was to update, reprint everything every week. Any hints on that? Yeah, uh, don't worry about it. <laughs> Do it anyway. <laughs> yeah, yeah, your budget may 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 be a little higher on the uh, uh, roll paper that you put up on the walls, yeah. but that's that's the that's the an investment that has magnificent returns yeah. on it because it's it's about people interacting and interfacing with the information. So yeah, yeah I mean, it's some a lot of it's electronic. You can you can do that, but don't be afraid to spend the money to change the information. So people can interact with it, and you know, weekly is probably okay, and yeah. uh, and you know that, and there's no nothing wrong with it, uh, because people can still mark things up, uh, but when it's super critical, right, yeah. as it can be, 
hey, don't be afraid to change things daily if you need to. And, yeah. and it's not everything about everything, it, right? It might be a, a very specific working group that, yeah. that is, is, is in a critical component of work that they need to see right. things on a daily basis or making daily decisions. So, yep. And, and yeah, I mean, the, the alternative to that is to have uh, the, the data electronically and you're just updating a screen. Uh, and there's nothing wrong with that uh, as long as the whole room isn't screens because you do need space for people to use their fingers and post-its and, and write yeah. on things and all that kind of stuff. But, but other than that, yeah, I mean, it, it, come on. It, it, do you want the information buried where no one can use it or do you want the information available so everyone uses yeah. it? Right, exactly. Uh, okay, so the next one uh, talked about great presentation. Thank you. Uh, will you share your slides? Yes, uh, we, we yes. do uh, provide that. Uh, and I think CII will be distributing that information, including uh, the link to this video. All right. Um, have you seen a big room successfully implemented and the project is already one third construction constructed? Um, my answer is yes. Uh, and it doesn't look quite exactly what you just saw there. It right. is a transformation to move from a typical conference style decision making process to more of a of a um, uh, of a last planner type environment and getting the room positioned where information can be exchanged. Teams can get set up. Yes. Yeah. And it, it's a, it, it is absolutely a little bit of a struggle. But when when your project's on fire, right, you, you need to add more production control, not less. So yeah. this is this is actually a fantastic production control tool, and we shouldn't we shouldn't discount that and its impact on taking a project that is one third the way through whether it's already doing well, but you see risks or it's on fire and you've got to do better. I, I you know I, I I had to think hard on the memory banks <laughs> because there's a lot of memories in there, but I do remember one in particular that was in Oakland, uh, your neck of the woods, my friend. Um, and uh, it, it look outside. About a third of the way, <laughs> about a third of the way. It's the Oakland from here. Yeah, you can see it. Uh, about a third of the way through the project, the and, and it was based on logistics. That's the co-located space they wanted to move into had not been vacated. It was a whole building, uh, and it was a very big. It was, it was a giant billion-dollar project, and uh, and so they were kind of in a cramped packed into a cramped ghetto space, literally. Uh, and uh, and then finally they were able to move into the big room. Here's the wrinkle. They did have the, the co-located space and the separate big room, and they did a lot of that right. But the behaviors that had been ingrained in the first third of the project continued. It's really hard for a team's culture to overcome the lack of co-location or I'm sorry, of, of collaboration in a collaboration big room space. It was a mindset, uh, and yeah. uh, and it, it was harder to do it that way. But yes, it yeah. could be done, and it's nothing wrong with it. Yeah, and you're spot on. Sometimes people set up with it, but don't really know how to operate it or how yeah. how the team should operate. And uh, the, when the project goes south, you know, a, a clever owner or a facilitator will rec recognize that and turn it back around. Yeah, uh, and that that wasn't a recent one, and maybe it's the same project you're talking about in Oakland. It could be. <laughs> but, uh, yes, and uh, at any rate, there's 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 a lot of examples where yeah. you know wherever you are, you bring in this, and you will do better. You'll make better decisions, um, and you will advance your own uh, not only the project but that uh, customer satisfaction for the owner. All right, so let's get through a few more of these. Um, so um, I, I like another one from Max, understanding what tech solutions are being implemented on the project and setting up the big room with access to the tech or digital reports for real time collaboration and data capture and access. I think that's a comment. Um, absolutely. Thank you, Max, again. Um, the other, uh, <laughs> some, some, some laughing there, but um, you know, there, there, there is that balance between printed uh, um, uh, updated and the tech uh, you know, I, I, I do agree uh, that with the future, um, you know, where we're heading in the future, what is that balance? Because people can now react, respond to information in real time and yeah. it can be displayed in real time. Yeah. Uh, now, the, the one thing, the one limitation to technologies today, which I think will disappear, is that you, you get a limited window of the information, right? right. It's not like a, a big um, 
uh, a roll of paper with all sorts of markings and, and you can take teams from one end to the other and make decisions. Uh, but I think, again, these, these uh, where it's heading, uh, we're going to be able to see information, move information independently, make decisions, talk about decisions. But, uh, you know, those are those are large investments um, that uh, are going to be special. But, yes, yep. uh, I think there is that balance. And I tell you right now, you have to respect the people that are going to be part of this, especially on the construction uh, on the construction side. That not everybody wants to interact with with digital information, right? They like the sticky notes. They like scribbling on something, you know. Uh, and hey, try putting up a schedule out of P6 and see what they write about that, right? So, so there is, uh, you know, there is that balance. Um, so uh, another question is, where can I find trainings if I want to be a facilitator? Dan, this is ah. you. <laughs> Actually, I, I'm going to put in a plug for for someone, and I don't even own stock in their company. <laughs> there's a, there's an organization in Atlanta called Leadership Strategies, Leadstrat.com, I think, um, uh, and they have probably the best facilitation training, and and they do it both virtually and around the country and in, in things. Uh, that's a great place for facilitation training. I'm on the board of INAFAC, International Institute for Facilitation, uh, INIFAC.org. And uh, there are some other links to other training that's available there. Uh, and uh, so, yeah, there, there's uh, training is out there and it's it's uh, hugely valuable. Uh, at one of the one of the projects that uh, that we talked about, um, uh, Dick Byer, and uh, at the time he and I were partners in an organization, and and uh, we were the co-facilitators, and we did a little bit of facilitation training in that venue for the for the folks who were uh, who wanted to to you know take turns facilitating their meetings, uh, and and also some feedback had a, a feedback form uh, for the facilitators who were open to getting feedback. Some people aren't. Um, so there, there's, yeah. you can, you can begin to do this, but you do need, uh, you need some smart leadership. Yeah. I, I would uh, reiterate the, the importance of, uh, of facilitating, um, uh, because, you know, even in, even in industrial space, when you talk about path of construction events and all that, if we yeah. don't have facilitators, there's always, there's always uh, strong personalities in the room. And part of, part of the job as facilitators to recognize the personalities of the people coming into the room. Because sometimes you have to either disarm somebody that's about ready to just just lead the whole team in a different direction, right? And uh, and get them to stand down and be actually in a more powerful position to hear what his his uh, other cohorts have to say about something. But yeah, uh, there is definitely a uh, a skill in facilitating. There you know, is and, yeah, scoping out the people for sure. There is a key word for facilitators, and that word is neutrality. Uh, and if if you're going to facilitate something with or without training, if you're not neutral, you're not a facilitator. You're just a person at the front of the room leading a meeting <laughs> because a yeah. facilitator, they I mean that the whole secret of facilitation besides preparation and enthusiasm is neutrality. I use the pen as an example. If you're going to be a facilitator, preparation, P enthusiasm e and in neutrality you've got to have that kind of that combination of things but the neutrality is maybe the most important of all right so another question um dan you know how do the decisions are, or who makes the decisions to create a, a big room and and design it you know is um how, how does how does that start when you're when you come into a project does it already have to come baked in or I, you know, it, it's an idea whose time has come. So in in, in most cases, uh, someone in leadership thought of it uh, and convinced their other leaders that, yeah, that's a great idea. They may have had to explain it a little bit if they weren't familiar with it. Uh, but uh, it, it typically starts with one person with an idea or a couple of people to say, you know, we really need a big room for this project. Yeah, and I, I would have to also say that it's it typically – those uh, more sophisticated owners that have been introduced to these these methodologies and they they want to encourage their supply chain to to follow along you know if they're not creating it they they're either mandating or or specifying it or working with their with their supply chain uh members uh partners that are already have the same mindset 
right? Yep. Let's do it this way. In fact, we learned off this job, that job, whatever job, and right. let's find a little better for, for the scale or the size of the project that we're talking about. So, yeah. Let's all um, get smarter. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, the, I think the, the, the other tougher question here now is, uh, how do we, how do we get all the people bought in? What is that? What does that entail? Right. Because everybody's coming to the room and as you know, in my experience, a lot of these people don't know each other. They may know yeah. be aware of the company, but they, they are coming off projects which may not have had the same level of big room experience. Here's, here's how I would start in that meeting of pulling people together, that kickoff meeting, getting people bought in. I would start by saying, think about the projects you've been on and what, what worked and what didn't work on those projects. And you start making lists in the big room on a wall, uh, lists of what worked and what didn't work. <clears throat> and <clears throat> let's resolve to not do the things that didn't work and let's resolve to do the things that work. Now you're getting interaction with folks. And then maybe you make another list, and that's the stop, keep, start list. What things do we wanna stop doing that we did in other projects? We never wanna do this again. What things do we wanna keep doing we've done in other projects? And what things that we know would be valuable, but are not yet part of this project, what things do we wanna start doing on this project? And now you're getting, and if you do that, you start with a big group, you break them into smaller groups of six to eight people because people feel more comfortable talking in small groups and then have them come back and reconverge. That kind of interaction for the first 20 minutes or, or so can make a huge difference on buying. Yeah, I would, agree, I would agree with that. And sometimes it takes other types of workshops to gain yeah. that alignment across, uh, across these project teams. And as, pe as people understand the objectives of, of, of a lean process or an ADP program, right? Um, the concepts of creating that big room yeah. environment, you know, starts becoming more accepted. But it's, um, yeah, it's the people. The people challenge is always is always the toughest uh, part of this. So, otherwise, it'd be easy. <laughs> yeah, exactly, exactly. And uh, so, um, I think that's it for our questions. I don't see any other any others coming up. Well, we're out of time anyway, so. Fantastic yeah. timing. <laughs> yes, yes, so well, uh, there we are. Thank so, you both thank you. so much. I appreciate you sharing with the members um, again, and we look forward to your next, to your, your next, uh, what do you even Production. call it? Your installment, yeah. your next installment of the series um, on yes. October 2nd, same time, 2 p.m. Central. We'll see everyone soon. Everyone take care, be safe. Thank Thanks, you again, Daniel Fernando. All right. Thanks, Thank Fernando. Thanks, Great Thanks everybody you. for joining us. Absolutely. Thank you, Dad. All right. Bye. Bye.